Hi everyone, my name is Suraj, I'm a TA for Data 100, and today we're going to be walking through the Spring 2018 final for this course. Let's get started. So we start with this section that talks about different types of sampling techniques and outlining the various sort of um, problems that we've seen in the course. So the very first one talks about this Literary Digest poll in 1936, where they aggregate lists of magazine subscribers, automobile owners, and telephone records, and received responses from 2.4 million individuals from the sample. What kind of sample is this? It turns out that this is a convenient sample. And the reason for that is because they just happened to um, have lists of magazine subscribers and registered automobile owners and telephone records, right? They didn't um, break their um, population up until up into different strata and sample from them. This isn't exactly a simple random sample when they um, sample from everybody um, randomly. They just happened to take whoever was convenient for them and sampled from them. So that's why this is a convenient sample. In part B, we're asked which is likely a more serious concern, um, and in this case, that's bias, right? And this is something we talked about in either discussion zero or discussion one, um, people in 1936 who own automobiles and have telephones and that sort of thing are likely to have more money than people who don't at that time. So this um, sample would be biased um, in favor of those people. Okay, part C, including more registered magazine subscribers would more likely have helped reduce what? Okay, so it wouldn't have helped reduce bias because we're still sampling from the same group of people, right? The same people who own cars and magazines and telephones. So it wouldn't reduce bias. So by process of elimination, it's probably going to reduce variance. Okay, question two, which kind of statistical problem is associated with each of the following tasks? Okay, so before we get into each of these questions, let's take a look at what each of these things mean. Okay, um, estimation is the problem of being given some sample, right, and we want to try and estimate the value the value of some population parameter. Okay, so it's like if I go and sample 300 people at Berkeley and I want to try and find the average height of people at Berkeley, you know, that's that's an estimation problem. Prediction is what we spent a lot of the time in this course talking about. It's when we do things like regression and classification. We're given some training data, train some model on it, and we want to use it to predict the value, whatever that is, whether it's some label or some continuous real number of some new test point, right? So that's sort of like the problem of, um, I mean, I guess it's an example of filtering emails according whether or not they're spam or ham, right? We're given some data set of emails and whether or not they're spam, right? And we train a model on that and use it to predict whether or not new emails, new unseen emails are spam or ham. Causal inference is more of determining the impact that changing one variable has on changing another variable. Okay, so these are three distinct types of problems. As I already mentioned, the problem of filtering emails according to whether or not they are spam is a prediction problem. B, determining whether a new feature will improve a website's revenue from an A-B test, that's causal inference. Again, so that's determining the impact that changing one variable has on another. Okay, and C is very similar, investigating whether perceived gender has any effect on student teaching evaluations. We're trying to see the impact that uh, gender has on student teaching evaluations. Okay, so that's not exactly estimation or prediction, that's causal inference. Okay, D, building a recommendation system from historical ratings to serve personalized content. So. Um, the sort of model that Netflix and Yelp, those kinds of things use, that's also prediction, right? We take some data set that we already have, build a model on it, and try and predict the ratings that people will give to these new, I don't know, TV shows or movies. And lastly, determining the growth rate of yeast cells in a Petri dish, that's estimation, right? So here we have a sample of yeast cells, I guess, and we're trying to estimate some parameter. Okay, and in this case, it's the growth rate. Okay, so that's not exactly prediction. We're not trying to build a model to predict values for unseen data. We're just trying to estimate some parameter of the data that we already have. So we'd say that that is estimation. Cool. In question three, um, we were told that we observe some sample of N marathon runners, I guess, from a larger population, and we record their race times X1 through Xn. 
and we want to estimate the maximum race time theta star in the population. Okay, so theta star is essentially the amount of time that the slowest person took to run the race. Okay, and we have these three types of estimates, theta one hat, theta two hat, and theta three hat. And we, when we're com comparing these estimates, we prefer whichever one is closest to theta star without going over. Okay, so we want to penalize the case when our estimate is larger than the true theta star. Okay, so our theta one is the maximum value in our sample. Okay, theta two is the average value of our sample. And theta three is the maximum value in our sample plus one. Okay, so first we're given some true or false questions. A asks, Theta 1 is never an overestimate, but could be an underestimate of theta star. So that's true. Okay, and to see why that's the case, let's look at these two possible cases, right? Case 1 is that our sample contains the slowest person, right? So either our sample contains the slowest person or it doesn't, right? In the case that our sample contains the slowest person, our estimate theta one hat will be equal to theta star, right? In the case that our sample does not contain the slowest person, our estimate theta one hat will be less than theta star, right? In both cases, theta one hat is never an overestimate, but could potentially be an underestimate of the true parameter, okay? So that's why in this case it's true. Either our sample contains the true parameter or it does not, okay? In B, we're, we're asked theta one, hat is never a worse estimate of theta star than theta two hat. That is also actually true. The only time when these two are equal is, um, and to be specific, the case when theta one hat is equal to theta two hat is when all n um, times that we've sampled happen to be the same. And that's the only case when the maximum of a set is equal to the average of a set, right? In all other cases, Theta 1 hat will be greater than theta 2 hat, right? And since we're trying to estimate the largest value in the population, and we know um, theta 1 hat will never be an overestimate, we know that theta 1 hat will always be better than theta 2 hat because it will always be bigger, right? Uh, of course, unless we have the case when all the values in our sample happen to be the same. Lastly, um, part C, theta 3 hat is never a worse estimate of theta star than theta 1 hat. And that case is actually false. And to see why, let's take a look at our two subcases for part A, right? In the case where our sample contains theta star, our estimate theta 3 would actually be theta star plus 1, which goes over, right? And remember, the thing we want to prioritize is never going over the value of theta star. Right. But if we happen to capture the slowest person in our sample, then our estimate theta 3 will be larger than the slowest person's time because we're adding 1. So in that case, it's false. Right. In that case, theta 3 is a worse estimate than theta 1. Okay. Lastly, part D, we're asked to determine which loss function L of theta hat comma theta star best reflects our goal of being closest to theta star without being larger than. Okay, so we know that in our loss function, we need to penalize the case when theta hat is greater than theta star. Okay, so that means we need to have some sort of if statement. Okay, and looking at the options we have here, case one and case three really have no conditions, right? They treat cases when theta hat is bigger than theta star and theta hat is less than theta star the same because in you know option three we're taking the absolute value so it doesn't matter if the difference is negative or positive the result will be the same and in the first case we're taking the difference of them and squaring it so again it doesn't matter if our estimate is three larger than theta star or three less than theta star the loss would be the same so options one and three don't really work now we're left with options two and four and so in option two the case where theta hat is less than theta star, our loss is just the difference between theta star and theta hat, but otherwise our loss is infinity. That means we're infinitely penalizing the case when our estimate is larger than theta star. Okay, and it turns out that that's actually the right one. But just to look at it, let's take a look at option four, where when theta, uh, theta hat is less than theta star, the loss is just the difference, but when theta hat is larger than theta star, the loss is zero, which means it's not penalizing it at all. 
So that's actually the exact opposite of what we do. We want to um, heavily penalize the case when theta hat is greater than theta star, but the fourth option is not penalizing that at all. So for that, those reasons, um, the correct option for part D is the second one. And that sort of wraps up the first part of this exam.